and we want to ask ourselves why there should be dispersion of the refractive index and why the refractive index should be complex. And to do this, To do this, here it is, we start from a very simple model that is the uh, so-called harmonic oscillator model that was proposed for the first time by Lorentz. Um, so think that you have a medium and that you can apply a time dependent electric field to the medium. Here it is sketched at a capacitor where you use a generator to apply the electric field, but in general, the electric field can be the electric field associated to an electromagnetic wave. Okay. Then you know that a, a material will be configured by atoms, uh, molecules, uh, crystal, uh, insulator, a semiconductor, uh, metal, whatever. Okay. What we do, we um, make a very simple model in which we say the single unit of this material, we approximate them with an harmonic oscillator. Okay. So we think that uh, we have a positive charge with a negative charge that is attached to it by means of a spring. So we make such a model. Now, why do we make this approximation? Because in reality, we know that there are atoms or molecules, okay? And in general, we know that if we have an atom, the atom is a neutral system in which you have as many electrons as protons. And you know that the electrons are distributed uh, uniformly around the atom. And that, so you have a positive charge at the center and you have a negative charge around and the body tension in the center of the negative charge that coincides with the positive charge. And so you have a neutral system which hasn't got any dipole moment. Okay. But if you apply an electric field, then this electric field will basically deplace the negative charges. And remember that the negative charges go in the opposite direction with respect to the electric field because the force is a uh, the charge times the electric field. So the negative charges will be deplaced towards the bottom. And we know that the protons are much more massive than the electrons. So they don't like to move, but they have a lot of inertia. And so in the born oppenheimer approximation or any approximation you make, you think that the protons are thin, okay? This makes that the two centers of the distribution are not anymore in the same point. There is a distance between the two centers. So it is as if you have a positive and a negative charge that are at a distance D. So you are inducing a dipole moment, okay? And at equilibrium, the force that is given by the external electric field is balanced by the Coulomb attraction between the positive and negative charges at equilibrium. Now, if you remove the electric field at a certain time, what will these two charges do? They will oscillate. So the electrons will oscillate around the photons. If there are no losses, they will continue oscillating. Okay? Now, in the limit of 
small displacement and a small phase, the Coulomb force is linear with the displacement. And so you can approximate the force between the positive and the negative charge with an elastic force. You know, the elastic force is proportional to the distance between the two charges. In Coulomb, this is not true because in Coulomb, there is one over R squared dependency. But for small perturbation, you can approximate. Okay. So we make this model. So we think that our material is composed of harmonic oscillators. Okay. Now, let's think that we apply to our material an electric field, a time dependent electric field. And with an amplitude in knots and with a cosinus like dependence, cosinus omega t. So an harmonic field at frequency omega. Okay. I can write it with a complex notation. Okay. Here the notation is slightly different from the notation we used. We used until now, we said, okay, I can write this field like this. Right, it li lies e naught times e to the minus e j omega t, and take uh, the real part of it. Or if it is sinus, I can take the imaginary part. But here I can simply say, okay, I can write the field like this, uh, okay? Or, or this field can be written as the sum of two. Uh, complex exponential with different sign and when you sum up this the imaginary part erase each other and the uh, real parts sum up to twice the, image, the real part and this two will simplify with this one and you will get the original expression so you can write electric field like this no you can write the field like one half in not exponential to the minus i omega t plus complex conjugation from now on. And now we go to our, so this is the excitation, the electric field that is driving the oscillator. Now we say, okay, well, if I studied the harmonic oscillator, I have to write the second law of dynamics. So the sum of forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Okay, what are the forces? The forces are the external force given by the electric field. The elastic force given by the spring. And eventually the viscous resistance of uh, the medium that is uh, uh, describing losses, absorption. Okay, they can dissipate energy. So we make a simple model, a mechanical model. Now, if you have an oscillator that is oscillating only along the x direction, so we will stick to one dimensional model, then the elastic force is minus k, the elongation of the harmonic oscillator. The viscous force is minus b, the speed of the, of the mass. The external force is the charge of the electron times the electric field, so minus E in the electric field, equal to mass times the acceleration. If I remember that the velocity is the first derivative of the position and acceleration is the second derivative, then I can substitute uh, to the velocity, to the speed, the x and the t. I can substitute the acceleration, the second derivative with respect to time of the x. I can get this equation here. Okay. Now, I can introduce two specific constants. One is the so called uh, um, uh, intrinsic. Uh, uh, frequency of this uh, oscillator that is the square root of the spring constant divided by the mass. This is typical of an oscillator. Capital omega is the intrinsic uh, frequency. And I can introduce another coefficient that is capital gamma here. 
And the name of this is damping, D-A-M-P-I-N-G. Damping is lost. And I define damping as this. This coefficient divided by twice the mass. Okay? If I use the definition of these sulfurs, I can write the equation like this. So this is just a simple passage. And I have this equation here. Now, if the driving field, no, this is, uh, what is this? It's a, diff a second order differential equation that is non-homogeneous with a driving term that is minus E times the electric field. Now, if the electric field is harmonic, as a frequency omega, I do expect that the oscillator oscillates at the same frequency omega. So the elongation of the oscillator will be given by a function like this, where there is an amplitude, X naught, times cosinus omega T plus eventually a phase. Okay, so the oscillation will be in phase or out of phase with the electric field depending on the property of the oscillator. And again, I can write this X solution as the sum of two complex exponents with the same notation as before, okay? I can write like this. Now, the phase term E to the minus I phi can be put together with X naught, and I have here a complex amplitude. So the oscillator will oscillate in an amplitude that in general is complex and it is accounting for the amplitude and the phase. It's clear up to now. Now, I can take this uh, ansatz, as we call in German, this is an ansatz, it's an hypothesis on the solution. And if it, this is the solution, then if I calculate the first and the second derivative, and I substitute into the equation the function, its first derivative and its second derivative here, then I must satisfy the equation. So I say I calculate the derivatives here, and each time that I derive with respect to time, I have a minus omega, i omega that is coming out here. And if I substitute in this equation, here, instead of the second derivative of x with respect to time twice, I get this, this expression here. Instead of the first derivative, I get this. Instead of the function, I get the answer that I gave before. When I substitute, I get this equation here. And as usual, when I use the Fourier approach, and this is the Fourier approach, the e to the minus uh, I omega t term is ruled out here. You remove the time dependency from the equation, so it can be simplified, factorized and simplified. You can factorize uh, the complex amplitude. You have the complex amplitude times mano omega squared minus two I gamma omega plus capital omega to the power two must be equal to minus E, the amplitude of the drive field, divided by the mass. This is uh, reminding us uh, resonance uh, no? in mechanics. So you remember this, probably. Okay? From this equation, you can calculate the amplitude. So the amplitude is complex. You see this is a complex number because the denominator is a complex number. Okay? So this is the amplitude. That means that your solution, that is one half the complex amplitude times the Fourier term is given by minus E times E naught divided to M times this term here plus complex amplitude. Okay, is this clear to you? So this is the, the amplitude at which the oscillator is oscillating. Okay, so you have charge, that is moving around the 
nucleus. If it is a molecule, you have charge moving along the molecule around the, the proton. If you have a crystal, you have the free charges and the, and the localized charges that are being the plane. Now, what does it happen if you deplace charge? You induce a dipole moment, okay? And how is it defined the dipole moment? Is the charge that you deplace times the distance by which you deplace it, okay? Then following uh, with the same, uh, by substituting the expression of x, that means that the dipole moment is this expression here plus the complex conjugate. Okay, this is the, the way you write the dipole moment. Okay, now you can compare this expression here with the classical expression that makes use of the so-called polarizability in uh, chemistry or in physics. So uh, generally, when you have a, an electric field polarized, uh, uh, applied to a material, you say that you induce a dipole moment that is the polarizability times the electric field. Now look at here. This expression E not. No, sorry. One half E not E to the minus omega T plus complex conjugate is the electric field. Okay? But as we assumed before. So all what is remaining here, it is the so called polarizability. So the dipole moment is the polarizability times the electric field, but it is written in this complex conjugate formalism. Okay, is it clear? Then I understand that the polarizability of the molecule, of the, of the constituent of my material, is given by this expression. And I realize that this polarizability depends on the frequency at which you excite the material. You see that it depends on the frequency. Okay. And now this is a complex, first of all, the polarizability is a complex quantity. Okay. Second, it's frequency dependent. Okay. And in this expression, you have two characteristic constants, capital omega, that is the intrinsic frequency of the oscillator, the resonance frequency of the oscillator, and gamma is the so-called damping and accounts for the presence of losses of absorption, dissipation, okay? Now, you can no, uh, rationalize this complex number you can work out the imaginary and real part. We don't do it, we could do it, but it's clear that I can calculate the real and imaginary part. So what we do here, we plot this imaginary and real part of the polarizability. And what, what do we see? Okay, we see that the imaginary part of this polarizability is a function that is given by a Lorentzian function. It's called the Lorentzian Bell function, okay? And that is peaked at capital omega. So the imaginary part is uh, very small if the frequency, you see here on the axis, you have frequency, is much lower than capital omega. The imaginary part is almost zero if the frequency is much larger than capital omega. And it is different from zero only around capital omega. So your oscillator it is dissipating only when you excite here at a frequency that is close to its intrinsic frequency, that is capital omega, okay? 
if you plot the real part of this uh, quantity, you see that the real part has an S-like shape, okay? That is different from zero in the limit of frequency zero. It increases up to a certain level with a positive slope. Then there is a region with a negative slope where it changes sign, it gets negative to a minimum, and then it grows with a positive slope and gets zero apart from capital omega. So you, you get an expression like this. Now, in the limit of a small frequency, what does it mean in the limit of omega that tends to zero? Static field, you apply a constant field. You see that in the limit of constant field, the imaginary part goes to zero and the real part is different from zero. So the polarizability gets a real number we, and you call it alpha, that is, charge of the electron to the power of two divided by the mass and the capital omega frequency to the power of two. But now, if you remember that capital omega is the square root of k over m, uh, you see that here you can substitute for k over m and you get that the polarizability is p squared divided by k, the constant. So it's depending on uh, charge of the electron photon power divided by the k power. And look here, in the classical physics, you write the dipole moment is the polarizability times the electric field. Then the polarizability is P squared the electric field divided by k, but uh, what is the electric field? Uh, the electric field times the charge is the force. So E, one of these two E times the field is the force. So you write the force here and you don't have any more the power two on E. You can add here X above and below. So this is the static displacement of your dipole. How much is it elongated? And you, uh, you see that K times the elongation of the dipole moment is the elastic force. So here you can write E x star divided the electric force divided by the elastic force. Since at equilibrium, these two forces are the same, you find that the dipole moment at frequency zero is the charge of the electrons times the displacement of the oscillator as it, as it has to be, okay? And you find this, so you, you understand why there is a frequency dependence of the polarization and a, a real and a complex part of the polarization. It's clear okay, in this simple model. But now we go a step forward. And what is the step forward? It is the following. So this is the dipole moment, okay? But now, if in a unit volume of your material, you have N dipoles and they are all the same because we are making the approximation, I didn't tell you, that all those units are the same. We are, every unit is the same. If you have N dipoles per unit volume, then what is the expression N Na number of dipoles per unit volume times the dipole moment. This is the definition of the polarization. In general physics, two courses, so when you study, you say the polarization of the medium, how do you calculate? You take a volume, you count the dipoles inside the volume, you calculate the, the, the total dipole and you divide it by the volume, okay? So if n is the number of dipoles per unit volume and every dipole has got the dipole moment p over uh, pt, then this is the polarization. And uh, you substitute p, so 
T is minus T times T, so then the polarization in the medium is minus N, the charge of the electron times the displacement of the unit oscillator. Okay? But now we calculated X. And so you can say the polarization, you substitute the expression of X that we had before, and you work out this expression for the polarization. Huh? And now we go back to what we said before, and we said, be careful. The polarization can be written as the electric field times the time, the frequency dependent susceptivity. No? We are, and times E naught. We are using a formalism when we have this one half and we have plus complex conjugate, but it's basically the same, okay? So this is the polarization. Then by comparing these two expressions, I understand that the susceptivity of my material, and here we are not taking into account anisotropy. We are making a one dimensional model, no? so we cannot account for anisotropy, but the, the, the electric susceptivity of my material can be written like that. And it is a complex quantity, okay? It has a very similar expression to the polarizer medium, okay? And again, I find out that the complex susceptivity has got an imaginary and a real part, like that. Okay? Can you follow me? Okay, this is yes, high, the susceptivity. And now we make a step forward. And you know where I want to get to the refractive index, no? But now remember, if I calculate one plus the susceptivity, I get the dielectric constant. So that means that also the dielectric constant is a complex number. And it is simply the susceptivity whose real part is deplaced by one towards the so you simply deplace the red curve by one to account for this one that is here, okay? And uh, you can calculate by rationalizing this expression here, you can calculate the real and imaginary part of the susceptivity. And now we, I calculated this. So the real part is one plus the real part of chi. And it is given by this expression here, it is written here. The imaginary part is the imaginary part of chi that is given by this expression here. And you see that these are the two functions. So again, the imaginary part of the dielectric constant is picked around the capital omega. The real part of the dielectric constant is it has got an S-like shape here. Okay, and in general, you have that the complex dielectric constant has got real plus an imaginary part. Okay. But we go further, even. we understand that if epsilon is complex, then M must be complex. And how do we connect them? We know, we know by definition that N is the square root of epsilon or N square is epsilon. This is valid also for the complex number. So that means that if I write N as a, a complex number, real part n plus i imaginary part, where the real part is what we are acquainted to call m, and the imaginary part is what we call now kappa, the Greek kappa, the power two of this 
expression must be equal to the dielectric constant that is complex. Then you calculate the power of two, that means that you we to have n square the, the second power of the real part minus the second power of the extinction coefficient plus two i k n must be equal to these two expressions. So the real part of the dielectric constant is the difference between the squares of the real and imaginary part of the refractive index. And the imaginary part of the dielectric constant is 2k times n. You can invert this system and you can evaluate n and kappa from epsilon d epsilon. Okay? And so, in this graph here, you have the graph of the real part of the dielectric constant in red, the graph of the imaginary part of the dielectric constant. You take these graphs and put inside this formula here, and you calculate the graph for the refractive index, the real part of the refractive index, and the imaginary part of the refractive index that is kappa and in already you find something that you don't like that is see the refractive index here is larger than one so the speed of light here is lower than the speed of light in vacuum you remember speed of light is c divided by n so you have a speed here I really have problems with the mouse. Here, the speed here is consistent with what we know, is decreasing to a minimum here the speed, then it is increasing, but here the refractive index gets lower than one, so you have superluminal propagation. You would have so light would propagate at very large speed, and then it gets back to the speed of light in vacuum. And then one could ask himself, oh, but we are violating physics because I have speed larger than light. But remember that in this region here, where the refractive index is negative, you are in a region in which the material is strongly dissipating. So it is true that light can go faster than light in vacuum, but you are in a very strongly absorbing re region, and that means that light doesn't go through at all the material because it is dissipated. But now we understand why we have that the refractive index of a material may have a real and imaginary part and may have a frequency dependency. And now, take this graph here, imagine to take this graph here, okay? Dependency on the refractive index on frequency and imagine to flip it. You flip like this. Then if you flip it, you see I reversed it. Huh? So here it is frequency zero, here it is large frequency, okay? And these are the flipped graphs and the frequency is increasing from year to year. Okay. But now remember, how are the wavelengths and the frequency connected in vacuum? Lambda is two pi C divided by omega. So if omega increases, lambda decreases and the reverse. So if in this graph, the frequency is getting large here, in this graph, the wavelength is getting large in this direction, okay? And, and now focus here, in this region here. So at the wavelength that is larger with respect to the wavelength that corresponds to the intrinsic frequency of your oscillator. Okay, and we take this experimental glass, uh, graph. This is the graph of the refractive index of main glasses that you find in nature, those that are used to make 
the lenses as a function of wavelength. And you realize that if you are in the visible range, light in the visible range is in between 0 0.4 and 0 0.78 microns, the wavelength, okay? And in this region, you realize that the refractive index of glasses is depending on the wavelength and it is decreases, it is decreasing if you increase the wavelength. So a glass may show to you a refractive index 1.5 in the blue and can show you a refractive index 1.3 in the infrared at the larger wavelength. This is standard. This is called dispersion of the refractive index. Okay, now compare this graph here with this part here of the curve, the green here. Here, the refractive index is decreasing with wavelength. Now, where is this frequency in glasses? Or where is this wavelength? in glasses. This wavelength is gla in glasses in the ultraviolet. So all glasses, and you know it, are absorbing light in the ultraviolet region. You know that if you want to preserve your skin from the problems that you can have with UVA and UVB beams from the sun, if you stay in the back of a window, they will not reach you because they are absorbed in the window. So glass has a resonant frequency, or if you mean, if you prefer, it is constituted by microscopic units that are, uh, uh, have a, a resonant frequency in the ultraviolet. And so at wavelengths that are longer than the ultraviolet, you see that the refractive index is decreasing with the wavelength. This is the explanation. If you would go to very short wavelength, so to a wavelength uh, that is corresponding to, an, to frequencies above the ultraviolet, you would see that the refractive index would decrease with wavelength, but in this direction here, getting here. So this is the explanation why refractive index of materials in the visible range generally is decreasing with wavelength because most of materials have their uh, absorption frequencies or resonant frequencies in the ultraviolet. Now, we could give a quantum description of that, but for the moment we stop here and we use this as a um, Start slides for the next lecture because this is just two slides. There is no more. This is very qualitative. But of course, if you describe your constituent not as an harmonic constellator but as a system that has got quantum levels, okay, then what is this capital omega frequency? Is this uh, specific? Uh, frequency of a atomic transition. And in glasses, these transitions lay in the ultraviolet. So that is the why in glasses, polymers, and generally non -mater transparent materials, you see that the refractive index decreases with wavelength, or you wish increases with frequency or frequencies below the resonance frequency, okay? That explains to you why there is an imaginary part and why there is a, a dispersion, okay? And then we shall see in the lab what is the consequence of that. So if there are no questions, and if you are still able to speak, we can stop here and go to the next laboratory session, okay? With this part and with the laboratory session and with the next laboratory session, we 
finish the second part of optics. So we, ha we have the bricks that we need to go ahead and we stop here with optics and we start with something else. Okay. Other questions from remote? Feedback died. Okay. We can 